I ended up serving on the DC Bar Legal Ethics Committee, even though, oddly, I'm still under investigation by the DC Bar. It's just emblematic of this Kafkaesque world that we're living in right now. Um, I have, I've been giving ethics advice in other terrorism-related cases, most recently um, one of the few surviving uh, cases on national surveillance, um, warrantless wiretapping. Um, it's all involving an Islamic charity called Al Haramain. And, um, they know that they were spied on, and how do they know this? They actually have proof of it. Why? Because the government screwed up and turned over a transcript of their telephone calls to them. Um, so they're one of the few plaintiffs that can actually prove they were spied on. Um, but then the government basically shut down their case by claiming state secrets privilege. and. The ethics issue came in because they tried to appeal that decision. And to appeal it, they had to write the appellate brief in a special government room on a government computer. They were not allowed to keep a draft of what they wrote, um, though they had to turn it over to the government. The government prosecutor was involved in supervising this special little government room brief writing session. And at the end, they shredded the banana peel of one of the attorneys representing Al Haramain, and they decided to destroy the hard drive with the leg of a table in another demonstration of professionalism. So um, I wrote an article on the legal ethics implications of having the litigation se security group babysit the brief writing of a party opponent in a terrorism case. So yes, I'm still very involved in it, and um, I, I work for a government watchdog group, the Government Accountability Project right now, representing whistleblowers, and I've dedicated my life to that. Um, if I could add a, a short anecdote that sure. might be of some interest. Um, after 9-11, um, at the Independent Institute, we were trying to figure out what we could do to get public attention to what we could see as uh, a real threat uh, to American society and the world. And uh, so we decided to put on an event featuring Gore Vidal um, and had um, uh, a number of people on the panel uh, with Gore, including Bob Higgs, who's here. And we had a huge turnout in San Francisco, sold out even had scalpers. And um, afterward, um, I got two email notes attacking us for doing this, only two. Uh, one was from Brink Lindsay at the Cato Institute, and the second one was from Henry Holzer's wife, Erica Holzer, co-signed actually by both of them. Henry Holzer was the attorney for Ayn Rand and was setting up a website to go after Lind as being this epitome of treason, demanding the death penalty. Um, and uh, the incident, to me, just dramatized the absurdity uh, and the, the insanity that was uh, steeping over American society. And um, uh, so I wasn't sure if you'd ever had a run-in with uh, the Holzers, because they were leading this charge. And of course, since Holzer was this attorney who allegedly was for uh, due process and the rule of law, I thought it meant uh, was particularly interesting and of course confirmed my suspicions of, of many of the people in the RAND movement in the first place. But in any event, I wasn't sure if you'd had a run-in with these people because they were, the vitriol that I got was the most extreme I've gotten since 9-11. And uh, I'll never forget that. I haven't run into them or dealt with them. Um, I can say that this experience has created strange bedfellows, but I ended up, one of my attorneys um, is going to be a speaker, I think tomorrow, Bruce Fine, um, who had been a Reagan, a Reagan Republican and worked at the Justice Department under Reagan. Um, and I ended up teaming up with, with a lot of people on the, you know, of a different political stripe. Um, 
And I also have gotten a, a lot of, even, I, I mean, I wrote an editorial the other day, and I still get hate mail. Why don't you spend more time writing about the terrorists who try to kill us? Why don't you spend more time, you know, writing about the people who've been killed by the terrorists? And I say, you know, I actually have written about that stuff and cite to my numerous boring law review articles. Um, but I'm talking about justice writ large. I mean, it's part of a larger, it's not, not about like some bleeding heart sympathy for John Walker Lind or not. It, for me, it was never about John Walker Lind personally. I don't know him, don't know what he was doing over there, but it was about the rule of law and following the rules and not taking shortcuts and doing stuff by the book. After all, I worked for the Justice Department and we were simultaneously prosecuting Arthur Anderson for destruction of evidence and obstruction of justice. So. Thank you very much, sure. Jesslyn. It's, uh, my name is Sally Hayes from Gainesville, Florida. Yeah. And I have a question. Uh, because you found out so early that he had not been allowed to have a lawyer and or they bypassed it and also that you had evidence of that did you appear at his trial did i go to his case? no did you appear as one of the witnesses no actually his case never went to trial because on the eve of the suppression hearing that was going to bring out into the open who did what to him and how it was going to reveal a lot of the torture that was when the White House ordered discovery be shut down and that this kid be given a deal and, to, and for this I not see. to go to trial. Um, I think they could have, I mean, potential, potentially called me as an, you know, a hostile witness or an adverse witness. Um, right. I, I would have been willing to just tell the truth about my personal experience. Um, because this case didn't go to trial, right. a lot of this stuff ends up getting told in the media, okay, what happened behind the scenes, what happened to the emails, who issued the order to shut down the discovery process, which for those of you who are lawyers know, is an integral part of our adversarial system of justice. Right. Um, well, one just follow-up question to that mm -hmm. was, is that evidence strong enough that the judge immediately, when he heard that, would have dismissed the case that he had, that due process hadn't taken place. This, uh, it was before Judge Ellis in the Fourth Circuit, who was not enamored with Lind, and um, was a very conservative, very conservative law and order, pro-government judge. I don't, I mean, if all the truth had been out that we know now, Yes, I think it would have been dismissed by even a, a, a junior green defense attorney. Um, but you have to remember there was, there was like this hysteria after 9-11, understandably so, a lot of us have lost people in 9-11. I was downtown when it happened. It was horrible. Um, and, and it was just kind of a vengeance. Um, that permeated the Justice Department and I think a lot of other portions of the government, a lot of other agencies. Um, and I think that seeped over and has seeped over into a Congress. I mean, we have a Congress right now that has all of the power and none of the will. We have a judiciary that rubber stamps everything. And then we have an executive that has this unitary executive theory that they control everything. And they have. Um, so again, I don't think many judges were willing to um, take a different view at that point. Um, and he happened to have a very conservative pro-government judge. 